الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله <تصفيق> الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها نعمة الحمد لله على منة الولاية وكفى بها منة وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا النبي المؤيد والرسول المسدد والمصطفى الأمجد والمحمود الأحمد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد <تصفيق> صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وصحبه المنتجبين ومن سار على دربهم وتمسك بهديهم إلى قيام يوم الدين ثم أما بعد respected elders brothers and sisters السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته allow me first and foremost to offer my sincere apologies for the ladies that attended my afternoon program today I don't know what happened to me, but uh, it is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I was struck by the worst bug ever. But alhamdulillah, I managed to uh, overcome my problem, hopefully with the help of Allah and your beautiful du'as and your beautiful minnat. It is amazing the human interaction and the human, you know, uh, 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 how can I put it, the human touch when it really uh, transcends all level of barriers you know only to see the beauty of a human being and you don't see anything else but the beauty of that human being yani for example firstly thank god for facebook <laughs> that people can actually air their sentiments and air their well wishes and i think this uh, social network can be a very effective tool for Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi an al Munkar. It depends how we use it. If we use it to our advantage, then surely we can make a world of difference through these particular social networks. So when you get, for example, people wishing you to get well, or you get someone who is at the, for example, as old as your mom, making sure that she calls you in person to tell you that I've done minnat for you at iftar time. I mean, this is priceless. Absolutely priceless. And this can only come from the beautiful facet of a human being. So thank you so much for putting up with me. <laughs> and uh, thank you for your du'as and thank you for your uh, 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 prayers. We are talking about the uh, uh, continuing to talk about the importance of religion, and we stopped yesterday at point number thro uh, three, which we talk, we talk about the encounter with ideological vacuum, i.e., religion comes to encounter with ideological vacuum. It comes to fill that ideological uh, uh, vacuum, and you will see, inshallah, as I go. Uh, 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 on with my speech how it actually literally helps you know fill your life with so much pleasure and so much meaning when you become somehow religious or affiliated or closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yesterday we stopped at the point where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says verily the remembrance of Allah soothes the heart and fills it with tranquility and peace as it has been uh, uh, verified and it has been corroborated by medicine itself like we said yesterday that when you go through a stressful situation the adrenaline glands fill the body with harmful chemicals the studies that were conducted at Dartmouth University and uh, uh, Yale University and so on and so forth have proven that the only way that these chemical or harmful chemicals can come back into balance is if you read something which is uplifting, something that is spiritual. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to confirm this when He says, Allah bi dhikrillah Surely, <coughs> with the remembrance of Allah, you know, the heart will be filled with tranquility and peace. Quran, brothers and sisters, is not to be used for sleeping time. 
Hmm? Some people say, if you don't know how to sleep, or you have a problem sleeping, read the Quran, it will send you to sleep. It will sing you lullabies. But the Quran is not about singing you lullabies. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about the Quran, he talks, Afala yaqilun. For those who are alert. <laughs> For those who are alert. But surely the Quran make you feel relaxed. There is no doubt about the fact. And maybe that's why some people or Muslims read the Quran at the time at bedtime so that they can find that tranquility and find that that uh, that particular peace within uh, themselves. How does it encounter with ideological vacuum? Because a human being cannot live in an ideological ideological vacuum for long and as much or as such his tendency towards a wrong ideology and a false values become definite meaning if you do not have a strong system of belief to rely on you have to rely on some sort of a belief in your life and that's why people then start going into tangents evil worshipping cults right that they take iblis as their lord instead of allah kabbalah hmm? such as her highness uh, you know right madonna yeah madonna or her uh, royal highness lady gaga huh? and all these uh, singers that come to pollute our minds with some sort of ideas that goes contrary even to the nature of a human being to the very nature of a human for example when you hear a song being played on the ipad or the iphone by our own muslim brothers and sisters for her other royal highness lady pink and in one of her songs you know what she sings today i want to sin that's one of her songs today and you see a muslim you know turning and shaking and saying today i want to sin can you imagine can you imagine the ideological vacuum that it creates when you don't have the ability to sustain yourself on a strong belief system we're not against music but we are against something that makes you lose your sanity and identity as a human being like the example i gave you that you become so engrossed sometimes in certain musical lyrics and beats that you don't no longer understand or appreciate what you are doing the example of that lady i told you in america when she was listening to music and ironing at the same time and the phone rang instead of answering the phone she answered the iron because she was under the influence of so much you know uh, 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 influence of the beat that was taking place that she had lost all level of concentration as to what is happening in her surroundings and in the environment environment she finds herself in if this intellectual life or if a person's intellectual life is not filled with sound belief and healthy teaching then what takes place superstitions and even destructive ideas may find way into his or her spiritual firmament and may forever pollute his own or her own cognizance even thinking becomes something that is not tangible to you anymore it does not synchronize with your your level of humanity when your mind is being polluted and that's why you find for example when there is an ideological vacuum in the mind of some people they resort to crime and I will prove it to you by statistics alhamdulillah thank God for the West when it comes to statistics huh? thank God they have not left a stone unturned everything they'll back it up with numbers so that we can benefit from these statistics in order to enhance our level of understanding and appreciation of what constitute a proper set of belief and a proper set of ideological uh, 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 richness when I of course talk about religion brothers and sisters I'm not talking about rituals this is the least I want to touch upon or even uh, 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 yani, uh, 
uh, uh, endorse or even encourage because Islam never spread through the medium of rituals. It only spread through the medium of truth and advocating truth in action. Living the virtues that Allah wants us to live in a practical manner. In a practical manner. Look at how our level of ritualistic dependency on Allah leads us to think in a way that is absolute insanity. A man goes to the mosque, sits in the mosque and he prays, Ya Allah, I need a child. One day, two days, three days. He's praying for a child. Is there a problem with that? There's no problem. Okay. Then the Maulana comes. He says, uh, Bana, uh, something wrong with you. It's been a month. Surely God must respond somehow. Huh? What are you doing? He said, I don't know. He said, have you checked yourself medically? He said, I'm A1. Okay. No problems at all. No problem. Then the Maulana left. Then he came back. He said, it just occurred to me, are you married? Are you married? He said, no. He said, get out of here. Who do you think you are, Maryam? <laughs> this only happens once. <laughs> Allah gave Jesus to Maryam. He's not going to give you a child without the completion of the human form. But due to that ritualistic, you know, endorsement that we ah, pray for anything Allah will give you. Allah says pray for anything that is logical. Pray for anything that makes sense. Pray for anything that is within the device and the scheme of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you know what? Allah has placed certain laws. And he said, Sunnatullah fil ladina khalaw min qabl walan tajida li sunnatillahi tabdeela. These are the laws that have been passed in nations that came before you, and these laws shall never alter or change. These are laws of Allah. It takes a male and a female to have a child. That's a law. Only Hollywood tells us a man can give birth to a boy. That's Hollywood. That's fantasy. Huh? That's fantasy when Arnold Spoch, no, I don't know what, fell pregnant. All right? Or uh, uh, Dino, De, I don't know what he said. Yeah, whatever. Okay? So, only fantasy leads us to that. But when it comes to the laws of Allah, and mind you, the laws of Allah never contradicts the laws of physics or science. Because it is Allah who created the laws of physics. So when he speaks about laws, he knows what he's talking about. He's not talking about something that doesn't make sense. For example, imagine you driving a 740IL BMW or a 500 AMG SEL Mercedes-Benz, right? Man, this is a $400,000 car, right? Imagine if the engine light turns on in that car. Where would you take it? To a German dealership, right? You're not going to take it to your local, uh, 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 I don't know, next door mechanic, right? Because firstly, you're going to lose what? The warranty on it. Secondly, instead of using fine 40 to 70 synthetic pure oil, he'll probably use the leftover oil from yesterday's Bakoras, you know, in your car. And he just stuffs the whole engine up for you, right? The whole engine is gone, finished, done, right? You take it to the expert. Why do you take it to the expert? Because the expert knows this car inside out. Allah says when you malfunction, don't go to Tom, Dick and Harry. Come to me I will fine tune you because you were made in my factory I know you inside out why are you going to the fortune tellers you go to women's weekly cosmopolitan new idea I don't know if you have these magazines here you open you go to the star sign and you will find the love of your life 
He will come to you on a white horse with a green tail. And he will take you. I say, white horse, green tail, what's this? This guy is riding on a turnip, not on a horse. Huh? This guy is riding on a turnip because a turnip is made from white and green, whatever, you know, that vegetables that you cook. Well, what fantasies are these, you know? And if you come and tell me, I will tell you one day you're going to get married. So what's the big deal about fortune telling? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says what, you know? He says, fortune tellers are liars even if it coincides with the truth. They're liars. They don't know they are to con you. Some people, you know, I read a book once. It's called The Sick Men That Govern Us. Have you read this book? Read it. It's about world leaders. It's called the book, the title of the book is called what? The Sick People That Govern Us. One of these people was the ex-Prime Minister of France, Mitterrand. You know what they say in that book? That this guy, before he took a government decision that affected the policies of his countries and neighboring countries, he used to consult a fortune teller. Can you imagine? This is the level of intelligence that me people have reached that they will consult a fortune teller to tell him whether you should, you know what? You should allow people to uh, increase social welfare or whether you should provide medical services to the poor and the underprivileged. So what happens if this fortune teller tells you, you know, um, no, it doesn't look good. So 50,000 people of your family or if you, of your community suffers just because a lunatic got it wrong that morning because he had a fight with his wife the day before, you know, based on his psychological state and what he is thinking at that time. And you know, we have the same rituals as well, although two different mediums at hand and that is when we abuse rituals in the way we use them such as the concept of istikhara okay istikhara is a useful medium but don't abuse it like someone he wanted to buy a fridge and he went for an istikhara is it lg or westinghouse come on please what sort of absolute insanity is this you know to take the name of god in vain and you know what six months later it came out on the lg it it went bust huh? it went bust you take another istikhara now we're gonna try for i don't know what another brand sony oh it doesn't make sense that's when ritualistic take over the mind of a human being and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the quran he says don't allow superstition to take over your ability to think even if your forefathers have told you so because that's the very concept the quran objected to when the prophet came to the meccan setup and he told them why do you worship idols they said that's what we found our forefathers doing and we shall follow the track the prophet said even though your forefathers were wrong they didn't use their intelligence you know what the answer was even if they were wrong Aji. Even if they were wrong, we will continue to do the wrong and then we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we say, why aren't you fixing this world for us? He said, well, I gave you a brain to think with. Hmm? I gave you 120,000, 124,000 prophets, same number at the, uh, as the coaches in the world. I gave you, what else do you want? Huh? What else do you want more than all this, you know, intelligence that I have given you so that you can plan your life accordingly? And I appeal to my brothers and sisters to study well the concept of predestiny from a religious perspective and a Quranic perspective. Imam Ali once was walking in the streets of Medina and a wall fell on him. So he jumped. <coughs> So, he jumped. One of those quasi ayatollahs, one of those pseudo maulanas, came to teach Imam Ali about qaba and qadr, about destiny and predestiny. He said, how can you run from the destiny of Allah? This guy thinks what? That the destiny of Allah means that the wall has to fall on Imam Ali. That's his concept. 
of destiny. So he shouldn't jump. Imam Ali said, I jumped, I ran from the destiny of Allah to the destiny of Allah. The destiny of Allah, maybe, maybe the destiny of Allah was for the wall to fall. But the destiny of Allah tells me with my own brain that I should jump. That I should jump. And you know what? Don't blame the destiny of Allah on the falling of that wall. But go and see which engineer built that wall under the table and got some bribe so that he will put it in two months instead of six months. Right? Isn't that what happens sometimes? You see building falling down all of a sudden. Out of the blue in Dar es Salaam four years ago, eight level building came down. And then you say, ah, oh, subhanallah, Allah willed for these people to die in that way. Allah willed or the engineer who was crook that he built that building contrary to council regulation. Of course Allah wills certain things, yes. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, make things in a proper way. And then come and say, Ya Allah, amman yujibul muttarra idha da'a. Take things within the legal framework of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to work within. Don't blame Allah for corruption that is taking place in the world, for poverty that is taking place in the world. All this is because of man making. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said this, وَمَا ظَلَمْنَاهُمْ وَلَكِنْ كَانُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ يَظْلِمُونَ Surely we have not acted unjust towards the human race, but surely they acted unjust towards one another. They are the one who caused this injustice to grow and to become bigger and to become more uh, engrossed in their lives and so on and so on. It's not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not Allah who wanted a poor person to die and live as a poor person within the context of what? Within the context that Allah wants you to be poor. No. You know the medium of khums and zakat if the medium of khums and zakat is the, in the way we understand it, that a khums giver will always be a khums giver and a khums receiver will always be a khums receiver or a, or a zakat giver always remain as a cat giver and the zakat receiver will always remain as a cat receiver then there is a flaw in the system of khums and zakat and by God there is no flaw in the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because what Allah intended that when you pay khums the khums receiver will one day himself become a khums giver and that's how you maintain a level of what a level of social equality you don't see the poor and the underprivileged and there is nothing in between until you reach the apex where there is complete richness or complete poverty that is unbelievable poverty that is not in the scheme of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is never possible for that to be in the scheme of Allah why is it possible then for richness to prevail yes we are told for example in some of the ahadith that speaks about the rich the richness of the experience of the government of imam al-mahdi ajallallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif we are told that when people take out their khums and zakat and they want to pay it to the imam the imam says i have no place to spend it People are already satisfied. People are already at a level that they don't want this money anymore. Why? Because that medium had already worked in the right perspective. That the khums giver now is a khums, you know, the khums given, uh, the khums receiver is now a khums giver. And the zakat receiver is, then there is a problem in the way we administer the expenditure of khums and zakat. So much so that we don't even use it in the proper perspective. Look at the Prophet ﷺ when it comes to the expenditure and the shares and the dividends of the question of zakat. There is one of the uh, items that you can pay zakat to. It's called in Arabic the share of sahmul mu'allafatu qulubihim. 
What does that mean? The ones which act as a buffer zone between Muslims and non-Muslims, yani those who sympathize with you. Those who don't want to become Muslim, but they appreciate your faith, huh? and they have no problem with you at all. Islam says you can pay these people a share of your zakat money. Yani what? Yani if you know that Islam is being attacked left, right and center, it would be good to look for a few journalists who are very good and pay them from zakat money so that they could put a good article in the New York time or whatever time. You know? Do we use it? No, 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 no. We become so pedantic about the expenditure of our money that we have to specify the race or the background or the madhab of where our money should go to. Subhanallah. As if our money when it comes to charity or as if poverty knows ethnicity or background or religion. Should, brothers and sisters, in your sane mind, and you are all intelligent human beings, should charity be restricted only to our kind? Or should charity reach beyond and transcends any level of religiousness or background or ethnicity in order to reach the human being and the human being full stop? When Allah intends and He says, give for the sake of Allah, Allah is going to tell you whether you gave your, uh, you know, Shia Ithna Ashari brother or not. Or He says, give for the sake of giving. Give for the sake of giving. Let not giving restrict you from giving to those that don't affiliate with you on the same level of, you know, school of thought or what have you. No, extend your giving to include even your enemies. Even your enemies. Because whatever you give falls in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before it falls in the hand of this or that. I'm reminded of a story of a young boy who was once roaming the streets of, of London or America. I don't know exactly the background to the story. But he, was, he became tired. He stopped at one door and he was selling clothes. So he became tired, knocked on one door and he asked for a cup of water. For a cup of water. The young lady that answered, the girl was a young, very young, was his age, nearly. She gave him, she saw him very tired. Instead of giving him a cup of water, she gave him a very big cup of milk. He drank it, satisfied himself. He offered her few pennies that he was working through. She said, no, my mom told me that an act of charity is not and will not accept payment in return. We don't take payment for an act of charity. Time came, time went. All of a sudden, this young girl fell ill. They could not treat her in her city. They sent her to another city. Subhanallah. When the name came of that girl, that young boy now had become a surgeon. And he knew that girl. He said, I will take care of her. When he took care of her, he did everything in his power, of course, with the will of Allah to cure her. And then he said, once she is done and she leaves the hospital, you write, you send me the bill. So they sent him the bill. He wrote on the margin of the bill a very nice sentence and sent it to the girl. The girl thought she's going to stay all her life paying this bill. But when she opened the envelope, she found all paid in full for a glass of milk. Huh? It was the same boy she gave him a glass of milk. He became a surgeon. Subhanallah. Because Allah says, when you give, you are giving me and your name is already recorded in my books. And then I know how to look after you. But give. Don't be confined to your own surroundings and to your own setups. Yes, it is good to give with your, within your own setup, but the horizon is the limit. It is religion, sisters and brothers, which can fill the ideological and intellectual va vacuum with sound teachings and can save one from a tendency towards absurdities and irrationalities. For example, look at our kids. I don't know your places of entertainment here, but I was here in 1989. 
not in Karachi. I had the privilege of visiting Islamabad. I was doing a dawah course in Islamabad, but it was hot. Man, Islamabad was hot. And we were coming from Australia and we don't know this heat. So one of our professors told our drivers, you know, these Australians are, you know, being barbecued here in Islamabad. Take them to Murray. Allahu Akbar, what Murray, man? This is a place to chill. So we would go to Mary every day, you know? We said that drive, please take us to Mary. Man, this place is unbelievable. The scenery, the I mean this country is amazing. You know? Wallah, my heart goes out to this country and I say, Ya Allah, bring some peace and sense into people so that they use this country to its fullest potential. Because it is sad to see the state of affairs of this country and what's happening to it. And mind you, it's happening because of our own doing. Of our own doing. Anyway, so what's the story with Murray? Yeah, imagine if you live in that area and you take your children to Murray, you take your children to, I don't know what, Faisal Mosque, you take your children to these beautiful places with gardens. The minute they hit home, what do they tell you? The big statement is as big as that. I'm bored. <laughs> right? Don't you experience this with all your kids? Why? Because there is an ideological vacuum. There is nothing for them to fall back onto. The only thing they fall back to is the gadgets. Sony, PlayStation, Nintendo, Wii, huh? You know that game, the new, and type. When version one finishes, or version two finishes, or version three finishes, what else you gonna fill the time of this young person with if he does not fall back to his ideological richness? There's nothing. Or chit-chatting, wastefulness of chit-chatting on Facebook, huh? that produces no benefit whatsoever. Except, you know, saying and words that we would not even allow it to our own selves. Let it, let, let, let the case be allowing it for others. Hmm? And then when someone says, why don't you pray? He says, oh, I slept at four in the morning. Of course you slept at four in the morning because you were chatting. What a beautiful eyes you have. You know what? The picture she has is fake. That's not her. Huh? You think that every girl on Facebook puts her own photo? You are a fool to think that this is her. And then you go into a mode of being mesmerized. I've never seen someone with eyes like you. Goodness me, if her was silk, then yours would be silk incarnate. You know? And where do you get these words from? Huh? I didn't, I, I, I married at the age of 22, 23, I didn't know how to express my feelings to my wife. 14 years old, 15 years old, I express it, good, express it, but reserve it for later for the right person. Reserve it for the one that you want to share your life with, not everyone on the street. Then you become a player. Right? You become a player and people don't trust you. A girl came to me in my center once. She said, Sheikh, look at this letter that this guy sent me. You know, and this at times when there was no Facebook. Right? So I read the letter. My God, this guy really was eloquent. When it came to the language of expressing his love, this guy was Shakespeare of his time. You know, I was a shock reading this. I said, you know what, sister? Trust me, this letter has not been sent only to you. She said, come on, Cher. Look at the wordings. He is telling me. I said, oh. Later on, you know what we found out? That guy has sent this letter in a fax to a thousand girls. He said, maybe one of them will click. Huh? Maybe one of them. Player! But the question is, would you allow this to your sister? Would you allow this to your mother? Would you allow this to your aunt? Would you No, of course you not. It's, it, dignity is far greater than allowing you to allow this to your own sisters and next of kins and siblings and so on and so forth. So that's why religion can play an important role in combating superstitions. Though it is true that even religion itself, if not understood correctly, may promote superstitions itself. And that is when we turn to ritualistic Islam rather than the pure 
pure essence of what the Prophet وسلم, and Ahlul Bayt and the righteous companions of the Prophet وسلم, had taught us and had fought, struggled and persevered for. Now let us examine the words of Herbert Benson, a cardiologist at Harvard Medical School and chief of behavioral medicine at DeConus Medical Center in Boston. What does this man has to say? He said, these are the words of that de- doctor, Herbert Benson. Remember, Google him. Huh? So you would know I'm not telling you fibs. From now on, no more fibs from these members. Huh? And anyone that comes to a member and start playing with your mind, stop him. You have a right for people not to abuse your intelligence, brothers and sisters. This is a member of Rasulullah. What is uttered from that member should synchronize with the teaching of Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And not just anything that we hear, we repeat for the sake of repeating. So what does he say? He said, spiritual belief is a powerful force and doctors cannot afford to ignore it when 60 to 90 percent of patients visit are in the mind realm. People are coming because this is not resting. Huh? 60 to what? To 90 percent. People are coming and say, I'm not happy. Right? I'm not happy. There's something bothering me. And you know what the Quran says in regard to this statement? And whosoever abandons the remembrance of the most merciful indeed shall lead a miserable life. It's you. When you abandon the focal of your existence, the access of your existence, which is Allah, then you don't find the meaning to this life you are living in anymore. And that's why we say we must always click to the correct understanding of faith so that that ideological vacuum does not come to haunt us and does not come to play with our intelligence. Number four. Religion is an aid to the progress of science and knowledge. Contrary to common misconception that says what? That says faith and science cannot marry, cannot go hand in hand. You know where this cannot go hand in hand? When the religion you affiliate with stops you from thinking. Hmm? The Spanish Inquisition brothers and sisters, it happened because of what? It happened because faith could not sustain science. Right? Galileo said, this earth we are on is not flat. It's round. And now they found out that it's not even round. It's egg shape. Right? Subhanallah. It's egg shape. It's not even round. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran this very fact that the earth that you are standing on is not flat. Galileo, a scientist, someone who uses his brain, he said this earth is not flat. What was he condemned to? Death. On the basis of what? On the basis of the religion of the time. Right? Because the religion could not marry with science. Because that religion was telling them that so much so also in some of our literature that the world is standing on the horn of a bull. Can you imagine a hadith that is subscribed to the Prophet وسلم, that the Prophet said that this earth we are on is actually standing on a horn of a bull. I hate to know what happens if this bull sneezes or does something else. I don't want to say what. Huh? What will happen to this world? And what will happen to the people who will inhabit this world? Right? Allah says, why do you want to stop your intelligence? Why do you not allow people to think and let them 
you know, have the horizon as not their limit when it comes to their thinking. Religion with its firm and sound teachings can be a sound, with its sound teaching can be an effective factor in scientific progress because its foundation has been laid on the solid bedrock of freedom of will and on the fact that everybody is accountable for his own deeds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, everyone is entangled in the outcome of his own deed. So go and explore the world. Go and explore the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, the, va the, the land of Allah is vast, go and explore it. Don't be uh, content with the place or the locality or the region you live in. And don't wait for others to think for you. For example, Jack Cousteau, the famous marine biologist, you all probably heard of him or watched some of his program. Jack Cousteau, he passed away now. He came across an ayah in the Quran. You know what that ayah is? Maraj al yaltaqiyan. بَيْنَهُمَا بَرْزَخٌ لَا يَبْغِيَانِ The two seas meet, in between them there is what? A barrier, but you can't see it. Where sweet water does not mix with salt water. Jack Cousteau, a French marine biologist, he had nothing to do with the Quran or the sciences of the Quran. He says, if this comes from this book, I want to see it. I want to explore it. He kept roaming the seas until he came to the tip of Cape Town, South Africa. He sailed and he started going diving until he docked his ship after painstaking effort to locate the meeting of the two seas. And he got to that place. He took some water from the left hand side of the vessel. It was salt world. Left, ha right hand side what sweet water he said to these divers go down go down and show me this barrier they looked they could not see a barrier physical to the naked eye and then you know when he found it we claim authority over it always the case oh yes we muslims you know this is the quran of truth you know the quran truth why didn't you find it yourself why were you munching pakoras day and night or eating baklawas and not going to the sea and to the world and finding these treasures instead of waiting for someone else to come and tell you this is how you can prove your Quran and the authenticity of your Quran. Again, when this guy in Canada, the famous gynecologist, uh, I don't know what's his name, I forgot his name. What's his name? No one knows? All right. Ahsant, Keith Moore, the famous Canadian gynecologist. He was studying gynecology and he said, according to science, there is only about two or three stages or three stages of embryology. He looked at the Quran, he found there is five stages of em embryology or four stages. He said, impossible. Impossible, we've been told there is only three stages. He went to the, you know, Canadian National Library and he asked for a stage which was missing. You know what was that stage? The stage of the leech-like structure, the alaqa. The alaqa that clinches to the side of the womb. They were not aware of it. And Allah mentions the word alaqa. Alaqa means what? Something that holds to something else. And one of the interpreters of the Quran, he said, Alaka actually looks like a leech, a water leech. So he went, he said, give me a slide of a water leech. They gave him a slide of a water leech. He went and he started doing his own examination on pregnant women. He found that at one of the stages, in the stages of embryology, there is a stage that the Quran refers to as Alaka, which is identical to a water leech. So he came on public national TV in Canada and declared his founding. You know the next day what the Canadian paper said? A scientific finding is found in an ancient religious book. Referring to the Quran. Another journalist, you know what he said? This is when falsehood blocks your intelligence. He said, yeah, it's possible for Muhammad to know that. So Keith Moore said, how? 
How did Muhammad knew this 1400 years ago? He said he must have performed the autopsy. He says, excuse me? Autopsy 1400 years ago? Are you for real? How could anyone 1400 years perform autopsy? And if he want to, then he has to lie in about 50 pregnant women. Because he has to go stage by stage. And then when he opens up, what does he do with them? Huh? He sacrifices them for the sake of knowledge and science. That's when the intelligence stops to see the truth. And that's when we fail to see the beauty of the Quran. When we let others come and discover the Quran for us. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is the one who said what in the Quran. He's the one who said, we shall show you our signs in the horizon and within yourself until you can believe that our words is the truth. Sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfus him hatta yatabayyana lahum annahu al-haqq subhanallah until we prove to them that this is the right religion faith in religion brothers and sisters teach us or teaches us that limitless knowledge is the source of this limitless knowledge is the source of this cosmos which is like a very grand book penned by an erudite scholar where every page, every line and every word of it contains a glaring truth which stimulates us to further study and contemplation. This attitude towards the cosmos undoubtedly stimulates persistent thinking over the mechanism of creation and consequently helps in the advancement of science and knowledge. And that's what Allah wants us to do. Not just sit at our computer laptops or laptops and chat. He wants you to explore what Allah has given you because your potential, as far as your ability to think, is limitless. Limitless. Imam Al Mahdi, we are told that when he comes, the world now shares one part of 36 parts of knowledge. He will come to reveal the other 35 or 36 part of knowledge. For people. Can you imagine the level of thinking then to a human being at that time? And you know what? 1400 years ago, the, the Imam, or 1255 years ago, the Imam gave us, gave us a bit of insight of that knowledge. But unfortunately, as usual, it took the Koreans to understand what the Imam is talking about. When the Imam says, when I rise, or when my time becomes close to rise, people will see each other in the palms of their hands. You know what we thought? Ah, Bana, the Imam is going to come with a miracle so that your palm becomes a screen where you can see your brother in the east. The Koreans came and gave us the palm. They said, no, no, this is what your Imam is talking about. <laughs> this is what he's, he's talking about, science, something which is tangible, something which is reachable, not something that is a fantasy. It's not a fantasy, brothers and sisters. The Imam says, when I will come, people will flock the world from east and west. In an instant. In an instant. And you know what we are thinking? We are thinking about some sort of a bird. You know, that the Imam will send all over the world so that they will come and collect us so we can give him our support. Just two days ago, I was reading a magazine, when I, not two days ago, when I was flying here in Emirates Airline. I was reading a study in 2050, a flight, a flight from where? From Hong Kong to, to Paris, from Hong Kong to Paris in three hours. In three hours. This is what the Imam is talking about. But who invents this? Airbus. <laughs> Boeing. But do you see Muhammad, Ali, Umar, Uthman? Do you see these names? You don't see it. Huh? It's always Johnny, Marcos, Elizabeth, Charlie. Look, just put one name in between. You know when that name came? I was watching the news once about that guy who was killing people in America. His name was, his first name was what? John. Then, what was it? Thomas. Ah, thank God he's not a Muslim. All of a sudden, Muhammad. I said, why? 
Why does he have to be John Thomas Muhammad at the end? So these people will say we are terrorists. You know, he had to be a Muslim, unfortunately. Where are the Muslims in the field of progress? And you know, I know they exist, but you know this world? This world is walking upside down because only those on the catwalk of France and Britain are recognized and Miss World is recognized. But when someone comes with an invention for humanity, no one hears about him. When someone comes with a vaccine for, you know, malaria, no one hears about him. When some, only the trash gets on it. Sorry to say this word, because this world is geared towards the materialistic aspects of our existence and that's why things are going wrong. I took so much of your time. I thank you for your attentiveness. I thank you for allowing me to speak to you. I sincerely thank you for lending me the opportunity to be with you and to put up with my anger sometimes. It's not anger, it's love, it's passion for the truth and I hope you can see it from that perspective and not from any other perspective. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Questions? The jurisprudence has come to its conclusion after years and decades of studies in light of Quran, Hadith. How can we in our minimum study re-examine and doubt what the jurisprudence has said? I'm not saying doubt it, but I'm saying jurists of the past are men and we are also men. What makes the jurist of the past more clever than the jurist of the future or of the present time? Why is it we always say they thought for us and we cannot think for ourselves? They thought for themselves and they came out with brilliant edicts because their time compelled them to come up with this brilliant edicts and jurisprudential questions at the time. Our time deserve of us to have jurists of the same caliber of the jurist of yesterday because God has given that intelligence to the jurist of yesterday and to the jurist of the present and to the jurist of the future. Why then doubt the fact that the jurists of yesterday are the only jurists and for those who ask and doubt about the jurist of today. If I tell you that some of the jurists of yesterday were even more progressive than the jurists of today, will you accept the statement? Take the example of Sheikh Al-Mufid. Okay, I'm gonna drop a bombshell now. Sheikh Al-Mufid says what? Who knows Sheikh Al-Mufid to start with? And who was he? Sheikh Al-Mufid was someone that communicated directly with Imam Al-Mahdi during the minor occultation. Yani, no one can doubt the authenticity and the knowledge of that person. Sheikh Al-Mufid is of the opinion that when the sun sets down, the time of iftar happens. Now, do you accept his statement? Or would you allow another 12 minutes before you break your iftar? He's a jurist and a renowned jurist. And he said, if you have certitude that the sun has sunk down behind the horizon, then the time for iftar has come. Bombshell, huh? Bombshell. He was a jurist of his time. Okay, then why do we do this extra timing for? They said on the basis of ihtiyat. On the basis of precaution. But in the view, and you know what? Don't go too far away for, you know, Sheikh Al-Mufid. Does anyone know the name Ayatollah Sayyid al khui <laughs> Sayyid al khui scientific, scientific opinion. Yeah, and when he studied the religious edicts of the jurisprudence of Ahlul Bayt, Salamullah alayhim, on the basis of the Quran as the question suggests, and as on the basis of the tradition of the Prophet which we call the Sunnah, and the consensus of the previous jurists, and the Aql, which are the four principles from which you can extrapolate the laws in Islam and draw an edict, his scientific opinion is what? Is the same as Shaykh al-Mufid. He said that once the sun goes down, iftar time happens. But we don't follow it. Right? Why? Because the other jurists say otherwise and we have been always affiliated with that opinion. So to tell me 
that why we doubt we are not doubting what we are saying and this is sorry whoever wrote this question this is not a reply to him personally don't take me wrong brother now Allah I'm not rebutting to you I'm rebutting to the general consensus of how we deal with certain matters I'm not personal with anyone so don't take it personal from me I beg you when you write a question and I respond to it right so we have to come to terms in accepting that if a jurist excelled in the jurisprudential laws of the past surely the jurists of today are as important and as clever and as intelligent to arrive at also conclusions based on the Quran and the traditions of the Prophet who may differ with the opinion of previous jurists and that is completely normal because the Quran is fit for every time and error it does not stop from progressing and I think and you agree with me all that the school of Ahlul Bayt in particular prides itself on the question of Ishtihad right so if we put to an end to the question of Ishtihad here goes the whole setup of Ahlul Bayt the whole setup of the school of Ahlul Bayt if we put a stop to the question of Ishtihad in that regard question number two when it comes to alcohol the first reaction from parents to their children is no way are you crazy but when it comes to girls getting balir at nine and wearing proper hijab parents are very relaxed and laid back can you please stress on the importance of proper hijab how is a definite must and there are no two ways about it I think this is not for me to comment this is a statement in its own so yani, I can't put it any higher than that I mean the laws of Allah are the laws of Allah huh? if alcohol is haram it doesn't become that hijab becomes halal yani, if hijab Allah says observe it it is as a law as when Allah says alcohol is haram huh? so why why becoming lenient in here and there this is something that we need to identify and learn why is hijab a important concept in our life and what is the meaning of modesty and what constitute modesty in as far as us Muslims are concerned I think the ayat of the Quran are very clear on the issue that once a person reaches the age of accountability or the age of uh, what we call it responsibility they must begin the process of observing hijab however observing hijab does not become an overnight practice it is something that has to be dealt with on a proper training program from the outset or from the moment that child is born or comes into and the question of hijab should also be endorsed and taught to our kids males and females for that matter right from the perspective also of both physical and mental not just the physical because I could wear the hijab but this is a wreck Yani I can undress the most hijabi woman in the world right if this is a crook mind right if this is a mind that is not based on curbing its inclination that are not within the lines and the parameters of what constitute lowering one's gaze tell the believing men to lower their gaze not to keep their gaze now, subhanallah you go into the markets here people they look at you is, is there a problem why are you looking at me huh is that it says ah uh, it's cultural it's cultural we have to look at we have to inspect you from head to toe yeah you keep to yourself there is better things to look at huh? ponder on the heaven ponder on the horizon ponder on the you know on 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 someone on yourself of course check yourself do you have to look at me from top to toe and why am i any different it's not you anyone <laughs> it's a practice you know in our culture lebanese culture sorry i don't like to talk about culture but if you look at someone for more than two seconds they'll kill you they'll come up to you say is something wrong 
If you want something, come and tell me. Let's talk about it. But yeah, don't look at me. You intimidate me. <laughs> huh? Don't look at me. What's the problem? Because we have nothing else to do. <laughs> Sometimes we are too much into other people's business. We pray into other people's business. Look at this story, what happened to the Prophet once. He was standing with his wife Zaydam at his doorsteps. You know, all of a sudden two companions of the Prophet come. So they, they come, they see the Prophet, they start running. So the Prophet said, come, come. He said, what Ya Rasulullah? He said, come, come. He said, what? He said, this is my wife Zainab. I'm talking to my wife, I'm not flirting. He said, Astaghfirullah Ya Rasulullah, we didn't mean it that way. The Prophet said, why did you run? Just be yourself. Why did you run? Come and greet me. I'm standing speaking to my wife. What's the big deal? No, we have to pray into, you know, sometimes in the West what people do, they come, you know, people work and they knock at your door. You don't answer the door. They go to the backyard. Look, why are you going to the backyard? If someone does not answer the door, it means go back. Allah said that. When you go to someone's house, إِذَا قِيلَ لَكُمْ ارْجِعُوا فَارْجِعُوا هُوَ أَقْرَبُ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ Allahu Akbar! Allah says, when you knock at someone's door and he doesn't answer the door, don't pray into his life. Go back. Allah says, and if you are told to go back, Go back because it's closer to righteousness. You know why? Because maybe this guy cannot receive you and entertain you as a host should entertain his guest because maybe he just heard a bad news about something happening to his family. How is he gonna fabricate his emotions in front of you at that particular moment when he's not ready to receive you? Look how Islam thinks about the individual and the feelings of the individual. So we need to set up these proper understandings from the day go. Nairuz, significance. Nairuz, right? Nairuz. Uh, why on the 21st March and not by the lunar calendar? Because Nairuz is based on the Persian calendar. Okay? And it is celebrated predominantly in Persia. I don't know whether it's celebrated here as well. Okay. However, if we purely want to look at the question of Nairuz from a uh, from the religious perspective, then we should look at every other phenomena, natural phenomena in the world and celebrate it. For example, Nairuz is the beginning of what? Spring, right? So what are they celebrating? They're celebrating the beginning of a new season, which is one of the creation of who? Allah, right? Then why not celebrate the, the solar calendar? It's one of the signs of Allah. Isn't the sign a sign of Allah? All right? Isn't summer a sign of Allah? Isn't winter a sign of Allah? Isn't all these seasons the sign of Allah? Then where do we end with celebration? We won't finish. Right? We want finish. So is there a strict religious connotation to the question of Nairuz? No, there is not. There is absolutely no religious connotation. And when Imam al-Ridha was asked about Nairuz, he did not say anything more than the fact that it is a natural phenomenon of God's creation. That's all. It does not mean that this is an endorsement by Imam al-Ridha that we should celebrate Nairuz. If certain cultures want to celebrate Nairuz and then endorse it with some religious backing, we say, sorry, we don't affiliate with it. With all due respect. With all due respect to that. Okay. Should we recite... Um, uh, should we recite Imam Ali's name in Tashahud? If no, then I want to ask, how can namaz be complete without Imam's name when religion was itself incomplete till his declaration of Wali on Ghadir? Well, this you have to take up with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this question. You know why? Because when Allah gave the salah to the Prophet, He didn't tell him when you read the shahud, you add Ali's name to it. As simple as that. Huh? So, if you want the words of Allah over what you want, 
then you follow what the Prophet did because the Prophet said what? Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli Pray in the manner you have observed me carry out prayer. And none of the Imams, none of the Imams, stop, tell me something. The brother or the sister who asked this question, which is a very clever and a very intelligent question. Did Imam Ali take his name in Tashahud? Well, if he didn't, he doesn't believe in his Imama? Or does he believe in his Imama? Huh? Did Imam Hassan believe in the Imama of his father or not? Did all the Imams believe in the Imama of Ali ibn Abi Talib? Salamullah Arna. Why none of them took the name of their father and grandfather Ali ibn Abi Talib in Tashahud to introduce it to us as a Sunnah? Well, if they didn't, then let us not use something that does not make sense in prayer. Right? The Prophet said, you don't do it, you don't take, that does not negate the right of Ali to the Imam. Does not negate the right of Ali to the Imam. Why? Because the prayer is subscribed or described in a particular manner from Allah to the Prophet, from the Prophet to us, and that is how the prayer has been handed down to us generation after generation by corroboration of authentic hadith to say that at the time of tashahud, we say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah. According to the Australian, full stop. According to the American, period. Huh? Period. No additions after that in this regard. No more questions. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you very much for your beautiful words. Uh, does anybody need a mic in the Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. Uh, just wanted to know whether genes play a dominant role by a bringing of children play a dominant role. Excellent. Genes do play a role, but I don't subscribe to the concept that genes play the dominant role in the upbringing of the children. One of these roles, one of these, um, you know, uh, uh, different aspects that contribute to the uh, raising and training of children, genes may play a part on it. But can you modify the genetic behavior of a human being? Yes, you can. Through training and discipline, you can easily overcome this inherit gene in the mindset or the psychological sorry the psychological or the physical built up of a human being so we can no longer use this as an excuse that when children turn out bad ah, it's because of your uncle or because of your chacha or because of your mamo or because of your uh, no let let these people rest in peace huh? let us do our responsibility towards our children and raise them in the proper dimension of what constitute, you know, uh, training our children rather than uh, bringing outside influences into the equation. Yes. Any, anyone more? Yes. A written question? A written question. Interesting. <coughs> okay, if there's no one, uh, I'll. Ah, uh, sorry. The so my question <coughs> about uh, uh, asking for this. Yes. Okay. Uh, if I understand mannat to be intercession. Intercession is a separate question, but mannat is. Mannat, can you describe it to me in proper terms? It's like people praying that maybe they say that I'll do this, the Lord will do this. Okay. Then I'll put a sheet on one of the mosques of the shrine. Okay, I will speak predominantly on the concept of intercession. Firstly, in light of the Quran itself, and in light of the practices of the Prophet himself, 
do we have the concept of intercession? Yani, do we understand from the way the Prophet ﷺ taught us religion to be and the Imams after him that there is this inherent concept of intercession? Or does the Quran itself speak about intercession? Okay. Firstly, if we examine the ayat of the Quran, we find that the Quran initially negates any form of intercession and then endorses one type where Allah says illa man adhina lahu rahman except for those that Allah give permission to all right that's number one as far as the Quran is concerned is there another place where the Quran speaks specifically about taking the names of the Prophet for example huh? we look at this ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ إِذْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ جَاءُوكَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا اللَّهَ ثُمَّ اسْتَغْفَرَ لَهُمُ الرَّسُولِ لَوَجَدُوا اللَّهَ تَوَّابًا رَحِيمًا The ayah says what? If only, O Muhammad, when they transgress, they will come to you and ask pardon from Allah. طيب, full stop, go home. Right? The ayah doesn't stop there. The ayah continues. The end the ayah says, and the Prophet ask for pardon on their behalf. Yani they say, Oh Allah, forgive us. And then Ya Rasulullah, maybe you can also do something. The ayah is saying this, not me. The ayah says, Walaw annahum izzalamu anfusahum. If only when they transgress against themselves, O oh Rasulullah, they come to you. Ja'uka. The verb ja'uka is to the Prophet. They come to you to do what? To ask Allah to forgive them. And then that you ask forgiveness on their behalf. What is the outcome? They will see that Allah is oft forgiving, oft merciful. Okay? The argument against this ayah by some of our brothers from different school of thought is that this ayah is applicable at the time of the Prophet. There's no problem. Yeah, if the Prophet is alive, you can approach him and tell him to do that. I say, okay. How do you prove that this is not a concept limited only to the time of the Prophet? Let's see the practices of the Sahaba. Right? What did the Sahaba do? The companions of the Prophet, what did they do? I don't want to talk about Ahlul Bayt now. Let's talk about the companions of the Prophet. There is a person by the name of Uthman ibn Hanif. Uthman ibn Hanif is a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a very close companion of the Prophet. He says once, and this riwayah is mentioned in Sahih Muslim, okay, or mentioned in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, or mentioned in Sunan ibn Abi Majah, or mentioned also in Sunan Ahmad. So you can go and refer to these uh, books. He says this man, Uthman ibn Hanif, we were with the Prophet once and a blind man came to the Prophet. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm blind, I can't see. Please ask Allah that he gives me my eyesight back. The Prophet said, would you be patient and I guarantee Jannah for you? I gu I'll give you guarantee. The man said, Ya Rasulullah, Jannah is far. It's Jannah is too far. I want to see now. He said, okay, go and ask Allah. Go and ask Allah. Say, Allah says in the Quran, uh, When my servant asks you of me, say I'm close. Call on me directly. The Prophet didn't tell him that. The riwayah says in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet said to the man, go to the place of wudu, perform wudu, then come and pray two rak'at namaz. Good so far? Okay, now the bombshell is coming. Okay? When you finish from your salah, turn towards the qibla and say, Allahumma inni tawajjahtu ilayka bihabibika Muhammad. Ya Allah inni atawajjahu ilayka bi Muhammadin illa radatta alayya basari. Huh? Oh Allah, I turn to you through your beloved Muhammad. 
O oh Allah, by Muhammad, I turn to you that you bring my eyesight back. Osman ibn Hanif said, listen, this is good man. I waited to see what's gonna happen. The man came and he could see us. His eyes were open, all right? Again, people will argue, ah, but this was at the time of the Prophet. Okay, wait, wait, be patient. Time goes, the Prophet dies, Abu Bakr comes and assumes the first Khilafah, then Umar assumes the, th the, the Khilafah, then the third Khalifa, Uthman, assumes the Khilafah. In his reign, a poor person came to Uthman ibn Hanif. He told him, oh Uthman, you know you are related to Uthman ibn Affan. There is some strong bond between you and Uthman. And every time I go to Uthman, the Khalifa of the Muslimin, and I tell him to fulfill my hajat, he doesn't. As Hanif thought, he said, oh, I, I have something for you. He said, what? He said, go to the place of wudu, pray to rak'at namaz, and say, oh Allah, inni tawajjahtu ilayka bi Muhammadin illa qadayta li hajati. Oh Allah, I turn to you by Muhammad that you fulfill my need. And see what happens. The man says, I did. When I went to Uthman again to ask him to fulfill my need, and before whenever I went to him, he would not even recognize me. The minute he saw me after I did this particular prayer, he straight away, he said, brother, come, come, come. Is there anything I can do for you? He said, yes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Anything else, yeah, eight, nine, 10, 11. He said, fulfilled, whatever you want. So that man comes back running to who? To Uthman ibn Hanif. He said, ah, oh, thank you, Bana, for saying, you know, the Haba didn't know Bana, okay? But I'm saying, he said, thank you so much for mentioning me to Uthman ibn Affan. He said, well, I haven't seen him in two days. He said, ah, oh, then it must be the prayer when I took the name of Muhammad, okay? This is not Shia, you know, hallucinations. <laughs> We're not talking about Shia uh, 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 riwayat. We are talking about riwayat that are mentioned. Okay, not that. Qurtubi. Qurtubi and uh, al Zahabi and Al Hakim fil Mustadrak. These all the names of Sunni renowned scholars that have written history of the Prophet. They said, A famine hit Medina. A famine hit Medina. And the people of Medina wanted water. So they came to the door of Aisha. Ummul Mu'mineen. Rudwanullah ta'ala alayha. Okay? And they said, O oh, Ummul Mu'mineen, mother of the faithful, who people are dying from the drought. What do we do? She said, go to the grave of the Prophet. Uncover it. Uncover the grave, you know, because the grave used to have like a canopy, like this one. Uncover it, take the canopy away. And then stand at the grave of the Prophet and seek Allah's assistance. Why? Why? Because the Prophet is an only person who came and died? Who has no value? No. Let us examine the value of the Prophet within Sharia law, within the Quranic law, so we don't dispute with one another. And here, this is an academic research. I'm not bashing anyone. I'm saying these are the references that are there available to us so that can both of us, our Sunni brothers and sisters, our Shia brothers and sisters, can come together and examine in an atmosphere of love, academia, intelligence, and see what do we have in regard to the question of intercession in that regard. Third and final point. Does any Shia under the sun believe that Ali or any of the Imams are separate entity to Allah and they can fulfill our hajat and need beside leave from Allah? If anyone comes and says that to me, he's a mushrik. And I will say it from this member, right? But there is not a single Shia under the sun that believes that. Every Shia Muslim believe that anything that happens in this world is granted leave by Allah first. 
right? And the reason why we take the names of the Imams sometimes is because we know that the Imams are infallible and they are much, much uh, regarded by Allah than me. Because I know myself, I'm a sinner, right? I know. However, having said all this now, am I less of a Shia if I call on Allah directly? Am I? No. No, you're not. The option is yours. You want to take the name of the Iman correctly, knowing that this leave is granted by Allah, and without leave from Allah, the Imams can't benefit you or harm you, and no one can benefit you, harm you, not even the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. So if we look at the question of intercession from that perspective, what are we arguing about as Muslims? I don't know. Why do we have issues among one another? If this is the question of intercession when it comes to the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt, Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'in. And there are so many other things that I can speak about. Now, I don't know, more questions? Hajj, you come stand next to me. <laughs> yeah, okay, I think the, uh, the three questions that have been given, each one of them requires a whole lecture. For example, I'll say, why do we take the name of Ali in the Adhan? I can't answer this in one minute. Honestly, because I have to give references when the incident started, why the incident started, and is it? But I will sum it up. I will give one last uh, answer. Does any marja of taqlid under the sun say, that Ali Waliullah is part of the Adhan? Does any marja say? Does any marja say if you don't include it in the Adhan, your Adhan is batal? Your Salah is less of importance? Your Salah is not going to be accepted? Your Salah is negated? Your Adhan is man wako? Does any marja taqlid say that? None of the maraja of taqlid say that, right? But you know what the question is? You dare not put it in the Adhan. You dare not put it in that book and see what will happen to you, right? This is the discrepancy that we have. That marja taqlid says it's not part of the adhan, but dare you not put it in the adhan. Of course, I'm not arguing now whether we want to put it in the adhan or not, but I'm saying from a strictly jurisprudential Shia ithna ashari point of view, is the taking of Imam Ali in the Adhan part and parcel of the Adhan? No, it's not. Part and parcel of Iqama? No, it is not. Why was it introduced? Because in one period of history, Imam Ali, with all his dignity, with all his status, with all his rank, was being cursed from the member of Muslims for 81 years. So how can you sink back in the mind of Muslims that Ali is a good man? How, 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 how would people know if 80, and you know what? The media campaign at that time, during the time of the Umayyad period, honest to God was worse than Fox News. <laughs> worse than Fox News who, I don't know what news we have here. In terms of disturbing the facts and changing, you know, and fabricating facts. So much so, so much so that Imam Ali was, his name was taken in la'nat on the member for 81 years until one of the Umayyad rulers by the name of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. History records these brothers and sisters. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the son of Abdul Malik, when he took the reign of the Umayyad period, he said, under what justification is the name of Imam Ali being cursed on the members? They said, because he was the enemy of Bani Umayyah. He killed our forefathers in Badr, who killed our forefathers in Uhud, who killed our forefathers in Hunayn, who killed our forefathers in Wa. So yeah, he's not a good man. Okay, he said you should change the la'an of Amir al muminin and he stopped it and changed it with an ayah of the Quran, which is Inna Allah ya'mur bil ihsan wal adl wa ita idil qurba wa yanha an al fahsha wal munkar ya'idukum la'allakum tadakkarun. And in our Sunni mosque, what do they say? Aqam al salah. 
after they read this at the conclusion of the second khutbah. Why? Because it was at the conclusion of the second khutbah that the la'an of Amir al muminin was taken. So Umar al Abd Aziz said, this is a false practice. I don't care what my forefathers used to do. It's wrong. Stop it and change it with the ayah of the Quran. And we say, thank you, O Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, for that practice because you're a man of truth. You're a man who stood against all the odds and said, no, we will not keep sustained. That's why the Shia during that time of 81 years and among those who were very passionate about Imam Ali, they took the name of Imam Ali in the Adhan simply and squarely for the reason of emphasizing that Ali is a companion of the Prophet and the husband of the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because there was no other medium of communication to really lay openly what you want to express at that time all right so you just mentioned that uh, Sheikh Mufid spoke to Imam Mahdi Mufid's with the Imam ended with the last Naib yeah 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 Imam she I didn't say he spoke to you I said he communicated with him and it has been authenticated and if you want the reference I'll give you the reference that Imam Mahdi sent a signed letter to a Sheikh Al Mufid and he used to communicate to Sheikh Al Mufid through signed letters. I didn't say he met him face to face and he sat with him and talked to him. No, I didn't say that. I said there was communication between Sheikh Al Mufid and uh, Imam Al Mahdi. Salawatullahi wa salam. I'm very aware of the four naibs and that after the four naibs, uh, uh, Sufara of Imam Al Mahdi, there is no one and whoever who claims that he has any connection with Imam Al Mahdi today or those who appoint the time of the return of Imam Al Mahdi. Are I'm not saying the truth. These are the words of Imam Mahdi himself, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. And I'm very aware of what the Imam has said and what not said. What are your views on cloning from a religious perspective? And what does our religion say about mercy killing euthanasia? In a nutshell, so I don't take much of your time, the question of cloning, if it does not lose connotation with the question of ethics and morality. Yeah. If cloning will enhance the productivity of crops, the productivity of cattle, which will enhance to eliminate poverty in the world, then Islam does not stand against the concept in principle. Right? But if it's gonna lead to cloning tyrants, <laughs> We're cloning, uh, 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 reviving a sort of drones that we have, we have among our myths in order to have these drones be the prominent culture or the prominent ideology, then in principle, again, Islam stands against any form of injustice. So when it comes to the question of cloning, we need to understand first and foremost, for what purpose is it being used? And Islam does not give a fatwa against cloning outright without understanding the dynamics of any particular issue at hand. When it comes to mercy killing, there is no question of mercy killing. Kill Killing is killing. Killing is killing. Let us not play with words. When a doctor takes an oath to become a doctor, the first word he is asked to do is I will ensure everything in my power to preserve life. To preserve life, not to kill, because that person decided that I had enough. Secondly, who knows whether you had enough or not? And who knows what is awaiting you after this? If you think what you are going through is bad enough, wait until you get six foot under. Who told us what's going to happen there? Right? I'm not scaring you about the grave, but I'm saying who knows? Secondly, maybe what you are going through is a phase so that when you end up down there, you are cleared. Why waste your opportunity? Why take that opportunity away from yourself and say, no, I had enough pain, I had enough suffering, let me go to my last abode. These people who say, let me go to last abode because they think life ends after this. That's the problem when it comes to the question of the so-called mercy killing. And it is amazing how we twist and turn terminology. Like for example, instead of calling a con man a con man, we call him a professional. How is that possible? He's a con man, man. He's a con man. Uh, killing, mercy killing. 
What sort of language is this? And in what connotation are we going to talk about mercy killing and how it conforms to the ending of the life or what constitute death to a person? Is it brain death? Is it total heart death? What is it? That's what the jurists argue about or debate when it comes to do we believe that brain death is death you can pull the plug or is it otherwise that is left to the professionals the doctors and the jurists to come to a conclusion of what constitute death and then the jurist would issue his verdict on that and not a general concept of what constitute the so-called euthanasia or mercy killing with this i conclude wassalamu alaikum jamian wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh